Hi, thank you very much for coming. My name is Theodore Chang from The Ohio State University. And I'm Yim Naderi. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Texas A&M International. I'm Joanne Vickiel, and I am a research specialist at Ohio State University. And uh, Melissa Adams Corral can't be here uh, today, but she is about to start as an assistant professor at California State University Stanislaus. Our talk is about critical mathematics teacher noticing, and this is <laughs> really interesting. It's, 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 it's a framework that we've been thinking about for a long time, almost three or four years now. And um, we appreciate you being here. So I'm gonna ask you to watch this uh, quick video. And as you watch it, this is the problem that it's gonna be about, right? So, um, Paco had 13 cookies, he ate six of them. How many cookies did he have left, right? So take some time thinking about how you would solve that problem. And then when you watch the video, we're gonna show you a teacher who is doing a problem solving interview with a child. And what do you notice during this interview? What do you wonder about? And what do you notice about your own noticing, okay? So here's the video. Paco has 13 cookies. He ate six of them. How many cookies does he have left? Well, we can think about it. You had 13 cookies and you ate six. How many cookies do you have left? Why did you choose subtraction? Because we got a table. Okay, so what you saw there is a child doing the math problem, you know, using a whiteboard and a marker, and the teacher is in a hallway. So this is a, a classroom here in the United States in Columbus, Ohio, and she pulled the child out of the classroom and basically asked him this math question, and then is questioning him about it. And she's a pre-service teacher learning about how to be an, uh, an elementary math teacher. Probably you might have noticed like the math that was happening, the sort of you know remnants of the U.S. education system of a child sitting um, on the floor. Maybe you might have noticed the child, the color of the child's hand. That um, you know, it looks like the child um, has, has a darker colored hand. Probably uh, identifies as African American. Uh, you might have heard the vernacular and the tone. Uh, this is. Uh, a pretty typical American accent. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the, 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 the ways various cultures and power operate in the United States, it probably sounds like a white pre-service teacher interviewing a uh, African-American child. And so what we did um, for this study is we worked with pre-service teachers and when they did their interviews with their children, they had to upload them to an online repository in which we put them into small groups and then they uh, talk to each other about the video. They basically started uh, cutting up the video and, 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 and writing their own commentary about what they noticed. And we use um, uh, these tags here that, that come directly from the work in teacher noticing. So I just want you to pay attention to what we see here and let you know who the teachers are um, that we're gonna be introduced to. So Ms. Simmons is a pre-service teacher who identifies as biracial and she identifies as um, a half black and half white. Uh, Ms. Harris is a white pre-service teacher, and she's the teacher who actually did the interview. And Amir is the black student who's in the interview. And so Ms. Harris, who did the interview, says this was the most explaining I got him to do during the whole interview, right? When she presents this video, she presents it in a way that she's, she's sort of frustrated that she wasn't able to get this child, Amir, to do a lot of mathematical explanation, which is the point of these problem-solving interviews. But then Ms. Simmons, right, Ms. Simmons, who identifies as biracial, immediately comes back and says, you know, he knew that eight cookies means that he needs to use a minus sign of subtract. She says, you know, he, he actually showed some really nice math here, right? He wrote the number sentence without needing any visuals, right? He just delved right in the number sentence without having to draw pictures out or draw little pictures of cookies, right? And I come in, so this is actually my, 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 um, one of the classes I taught. So, and so I came in and I said, hey, you know, back up, right? And not, don't just jump, jump directly into operations now. So, you know, for those of us involved in elementary math education, right? It can be really, really uh, jarring, right? And it can almost dismissive of not listening to a child's mathematical thinking and just forcing them into a number sentence. And then Ms. Simmons comes back and says, you know, I don't know what you all asked him, but I see that he understands that you ate means take away. So he chose subtraction. Maybe you could have asked him if you ate means you get uh, more cookies, right? And sometimes students don't realize all their steps until you point them out for them. So Ms. Simmons comes back again and she recognizes even more and basically is, is, is saying, there's a lot here. There's a lot of richness in this child's mathematical thinking that we can unpack as opposed to just being frustrated with, this was the most I got explaining I got him to do during the whole interview. So here we have an example of 
you know, a white preserver teacher and a black, uh, sorry, a, bi a biracial preserver teacher working with a black child, working with a video of a black child. And the white teacher sort of has a deficit approach, is frustrated by the interaction she had with the black child. And the biracial teacher basically is calling out all the great things that the, the child is doing and then ways in which it can be impacted even more, right? And this is an example of what <laughs> Smith calls racial battle fatigue. It's exhausting. It's exhausting when you're the person who's oppressed to constantly have to teach the oppressor about this oppression while this oppression is happening, right? For those of us like who you know have marginalized identities, it feels like you're constantly fighting. It's a fatigue for having to fight this all the time. And so what we 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 notice here, right, is that most of the noticing that involved power and privilege when we did this work with many of our teachers came from teachers of color, teachers who identify, right, as in the United States as non-white in some way, and they were the ones who noticed the most about the power and privilege that happens in the action, interactions between teacher and student. Um, yeah, so the data sources for this study are from two elementary math methods courses taught at the location of an urban elementary school. Uh, the pre-service teachers here were from two different autumn courses, um, and they employed cognitively guided instruction methods during the problem solving interviews, um, which were documented using iPad minis, GoReact, and Flipgrid. It's approximately 81% of the, the students were white. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. So, so this context here in Columbus, Ohio, in the United States, right, is heavily white, right? But it's not entirely white. It's not completely racially homogenous, right? So there, 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 there is some variance here. And you know, just this is a photo of our teachers who are the adults working with children. And this is the context that we're, we're in. Uh, we had our pre-service teachers comment on their classmates' um, teachings. Um, and we asked the students to kind of notice uh, what, what the students, uh, what, what the pre-service teachers were um, doing. Um, and um, interpret and respond. The teachers met with the students um, over a course of four weeks. And um, later on, they also um, did a report, uh, wrote a report um, for their parents um, about the progress of the student. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. And, and, and so this is, um, you know, we're using a lot of the work on teacher noticing in particular. Um, but what we know, what we inserted here, sort of what our intervention here is, we note inserted them commenting on issues of power and privilege in the interactions that they saw with each other, right? So this is a teacher working with a child. This is what, they, what it looks like when they're doing their interviews. And then we wanted them to not just notice the mathematical thinking, but also what's going on in terms of power and privilege in the inter interaction. So in math education, this is, this is the main problem. We currently focus heavily on helping teachers learn to listen and notice the children's mathematical thinking. And as a field, we're just starting to learn how to open up space to learn to listen and notice to not just the math thinking, but who children position themselves to be in terms of identity and power. And so this is what we and, and you know, uh, Louis, Adirendra, Jessup, Shaw, Coles, and a lot of amazing uh, math educators, some who might be on this call right now, um, have really started to focus on, right? Like listening to children's mathematical thinking goes hand in hand with also understanding who they are, uh, uh, seeing them for the ways that they want to position themselves and their 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 complete selves. The math teacher education, that's the, the field or the realm that we're talking about. The dialectic spiral is in reference to how conversations, it's, it builds off of indigenous ways of knowing and um, it's how different conversations come together um, over time and over space and over multiple interactions. And that, that that interaction actually helps these conversations unfold over time and space to create an entirely new and different understanding. But that understanding is also based off conversation. So what that means in the context of this classroom is, um, so sometimes uh, we, uh, the, the cohort would meet like in a community garden and there are certain observations that are made and then they're discussed in the classroom and there's a video uploaded and then that video, there's commentary that's happening um, in, in chat form, but also in the classroom. Uh, the teachers are also responding back or uh, or talking to each other and there's also 
um, we had three observers, I think, like it, one of, I was one of them, then uh, Joanne and they were Hoche, that would look at how the teachers are doing their case studies and give observations from multiple angles. So it wasn't, it's a one unilateral way of, of commenting on what the teachers were doing. It's rather a conversation that unfolds with a lot of feedback and back and forth. And then of course, critical race theory, uh, Mathematesh is also builds of critical race theory and decolonizing mathematics. Um, and it really pushes back um, against the hierarchies that exist within mathematics education and the privileging of certain ways of thinking over others. And of course, critical race theory um, is the, the importance of looking at how power and privilege and race um, specifically within the context of the United States plays into um, how students are positioned or racialized and what that means that sometimes students of color or um, in a lot of situations, instead of focusing on their, the value of their knowledges and what they bring into the classroom, they're assessed within a deficit lens, which is what they're lacking rather than a starting point of what they know and how that can be built forward. So math teacher noticing, this is all work that many of us know. Um, and, and what we're sort of focusing on is connecting this idea of uh, blind spots within race and culture, not just blind spots within math. Um, critical race theory, particularly this the construct of mathematics that um, Rachel Gutierrez has, has written a lot about, right? The white gaze, anti-blackness, all of this is part of the way that it's positioned, but there also is a way to rehumanize mathematics. You know, each and every student holds a special math knowledge and identity. Free service teachers, um, they, they're, they're noticing something and then the teachers uh, are bringing their noticing. Um, and then this noticing is bringing, brought back into a larger conversation within the classroom. So it was the multiple settings over time and space of how the, the same idea is discussed in multiple, in different angles, multiple ways from different people. And what that uh, creates is a space in between um, that creates wait time, caring, space, listening, um, letting go of control of the outcome of what the conversation needs to be and then moving more into understanding. And over time, this builds a, a, a level of meta understanding of one's own teaching. So the teachers can start noticing what they're noticing, what they're noticed about their noticing because of the conversation that is happening over time from multiple angles. And then that allows them to engage in recognizing their own blind spots and understanding how the blind spots that they have is actually impacting their teaching. Um, and it kind of, it's an ongoing, it, it never stops. And that with the assumption that teacher teaching is an, is an like, it's always evolving, it's always changing and there are always new understandings. So what, what, it, what I love that you get to that, you know, this, this, this idea that pausing, right? This idea that we can create spaces and it is, it is very um, decolonial, right? It is a, a way to open up space for people to pay attention, for the students and teachers to pay attention to who they are and how it connects and to be aware of their of, of their own spots as opposed to shame. The conversation them. also opens up a lot of questions and in opening questions, um, between the pausing and the questions, there's a lot of learning that happens without shaming too. We found that the location that the you know, teachers of color particularly notice in mathematical thinking, they're able to relocate the problem away from the child and into the sort of a systemic problem of pedagogical practice. They, they notice the possibility of what is possible and as opposed to what is what knowledge is not there, right? Um, racism is really, like, it, it becomes really apparent when deficit-oriented racial blind spots are there, right, are right there in the ways that um, teachers are interacting with their children, and knowledge, right? Redirection, uh, redirecting attention to children's math knowledge, right, what the children are able to show, as opposed to the lack of children's knowledge, right, and this is a sort of traditional deficit perspective that we see in mathematics education. And you know this just continues to grow, and it's it's built on the amazing work of so many people here, and so many people that have, have been really focusing on identity and, and and the connections to culture, power, and teacher education. So thank you very much. So here's just general yeah. implications, right? But I I think that the biggest thing is that we need to stop putting this work onto our teachers of color, right? We need to, particularly here in the United States, like it, it's the teachers of color who are doing a lot of this work, and they don't need to be, right? They need to be that the focus needs to be on how to help them. I think um, that's it, that's our time. So thank you very much. Thank you.